So let's uh, have a look at tonight's question seven. And uh, let's see what happens as we go along. Uh, first one, dear Ajahn Mahalia, uh, thank you for being uh, here and telling, uh, sorry, telling, uh, uh, exploring the Buddha's teachings. Uh, to me, as you are doing really good, Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu, okay? I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, my question, how to be peaceful in family life with different ways of living, thinking uh, uh, with emotions, wounds, scars, <coughs> history of good and bad, sometimes it's hard to uh, control and stay peaceful. What advice can we give for staying away? Is staying away the best solution? Thank you very much. Um, sometimes staying away a little bit is always a, can be a good thing, yeah, because uh, as you say, there's always a lot of history in, in family life. There's always uh, things from the past that are kind of great and, and have a tendency to flare up again. Uh, so getting a bit of distance is always very useful. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're all saying absence makes the heart grow fonder. So if you a bit of absence, a bit of time away, often is a very suit, useful thing to do. And one of the great things in that coming on a retreat uh, is that you have a chance to understand a bit more about the problems in your life, uh, about the sort of things that cause problems and get a bit of perspective on things. Uh, and this is one of the most important things, is to know yourself well enough uh, to know the things that are difficult in your life. Yeah? And, and one of the great things about being here is to get some more perspective on precisely on that. Uh. So, um, uh, spend some of the time, you know, you know, a lot of the time we, we sit on the mat, and when you sit on the mat, uh, often, you, uh, uh, you know, it's easy to focus on the breath, uh, sometimes, or on the meditation object. Uh, at other times, it's more useful to do a bit more free kind of meditation, where you, all you do is really just observe your mind and see what happens inside your mind, uh, and to kind of find out what your problems are, and what are the issues that you have to deal with. Uh, it's good to just often just have an awareness of the mind. And sometimes just by walking around a bit more freely, uh, you often get to understand yourself. Once you, it is very clear what the problems are, uh, then you can start the process of kind of, of, of forgiving and letting go of past things. Uh, yeah, and uh, it is not so hard. We're going to have a look at a few suttas later on, how to de deal with uh, things like uh, ill will and negativity towards other people. Uh, it is not that, that difficult. Of course, uh, yeah, in relationships have been going on for a long time, it is more difficult uh, because uh, uh, it is often quite ingrained. Uh, but still, it can be done if you really apply <coughs> yourself to these things. Uh, and you understand basic things like people are conditioned, they are the way they have to be, that sort of thing. Uh, and gradually you can kind of uh, see people as, uh, as conditioned phenomena rather than seeing them as agents who try to make life difficult for others or whatever it is. Uh, this is really a lot of the uh, solution to these problems lies right there, just in viewing people, viewing other people in the right way. Uh, and as you do that, forgiveness kind of comes out of that. Uh. Um, so, uh, yeah, st uh, staying away is, is good, uh, yeah. Uh, knowing when you kind of reached your limit, when you lose your perspective and take some time out to come on a retreat, do something else, do something different. Uh, I think this is very useful when relationships are, are difficult. Uh, and sometimes we have no choice but to stay in those relationships. Yeah, it's, not, it's not that difficult to, to leave. If it gets really, really bad, of course, you can also leave as well. There's nothing wrong with that from a Buddhist point of view. It becomes too unbearable. And sometimes you have to leave for a while, at least for a while, and see what happens. That's also acceptable from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, to kind of stay in a relationship just because it is someone who is supposed to be close to you, often it is not a solution either. Take a kind of a long time out and can often be helpful as well. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, you, looking after oneself is actually very important on the Buddhist path. Uh, and uh, if you, so if you, um, if you don't look after yourself, uh, it becomes very hard to look after others. Uh. Okay. Good. Okay. In my work, I'm trying to help people who have. Uh, psychological problems. Do you have any thoughts about how to be compassionate and helpful without absorbing too much of their sometimes uh, 
negative energies and getting affected by them there. Thank you, Herm. Um, uh, how to avoid getting absorbing too much of the energies of people around you? Um, it, there is obviously a limit. We are always conditioned by our environment to some extent, and, and uh, for that reason, it is important to kind of, you know, hang out with the right people. That's why we have this idea of Kalyana Mitta on the Buddhist path, that precisely because uh, conditioning is so powerful there. Uh, yeah, so it's always important to have the right friends and the right environment and the right kind of teachers and, and all these kind of things. Uh, this matters enormously precisely because conditioning is so powerful there. Uh, and this is why you start off on an old natural path with right view. Where does that right view comes, come from? Well, it comes from reading the suttas, from listening to you know, teach things that are uh, in conformity with the suttas and all of these kind of things. Uh. So this is so important to have that right conditioning here. I think the kind of conditioning that you get from being around people who are psychologically disturbed, uh, it is not so, uh, it doesn't really matter that much, it's temporary. Yeah? You are there during your work period and then when you come, come back again afterwards, uh, it doesn't take long before you kind of readjust back into, ordinary, uh, into your ordinary life again. It is a temporary kind of unbalance, uh, and I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Uh, what is more important is that you have the ability to, uh, you know, to be kind while you're there, uh, to kind of look after these people, to have a sense of care and compassion while you're there. Uh, and if you're able to do that without allowing your kind of morality and your ethical conduct to be dragged down, uh, that is when it starts to become really problematic. Uh, if you get so deluded by the energy that you lose your ability to be kind, that is where the problem really arises. So uh, that is what matters. So if you, even if you are a bit influenced by, by these things, and you feel, if, even if it feels uncomfortable, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned as long as you don't feel it is, is a kind of a permanent problem. Uh, but generally speaking, the thing that stops you from being influenced by others is mindfulness. Yeah? The fact that you have a kind of ability and you have kind of, it's almost like you have a, a little bit of a, a barrier between yourself and others. That's what mindfulness does. It means you're not kind of, you're not absorbing the things around you in quite the same way. But you have the ability to see things in perspective. So if you can be a bit more mindful during the day, that's going to, that's going to help you out. And to be able to do that, you know, take a little breaks now and again if you can. Sit down, do some meditation, get a bit of distance from the people around you. And as you do that, you rebalance yourself, you get mindfulness coming back again, uh, and that enables you to uh, control your mind much more. Uh. One of the things about mindfulness, if, if your mindfulness is strong, uh, it feels like you are in charge of yourself. Uh. It's one of the marvelous things about mindfulness. It feels like you are in control of your mind, of your actions, uh, and also your relationships with other people. Uh. This is kind of what mindfulness does. It gives you a feeling of being uh, in control of your life. Uh. And that is, of course, a great thing when it happens. Uh. So uh, there isn't any kind of fine magical solution to this thing. If, if it is very disturbing for you and you find it very hard uh, in a very bad way, it kind of drags you down, <coughs> especially over the long term, uh, then maybe you would even consider f finding another job if that's the case. Uh, because uh, your own well-being is always should always be uh, you know, the paramount thing in, in a situation. Not allow things to drag you down because that destroys your own life and you know our primary responsibility is to our own life to make sure that we uh, you know we uh, kind of are balanced and we are in the right space etc okay so, so many of these questions are very difficult yeah there isn't any kind of final answer to many of these things so you just have to uh, kind of try to investigate for yourself and see what you can do now dear Ajahn, could you explain the walking meditation please thank you okay walking meditation so I, uh, is, I would recommend you to try some walking meditation as part of the practice uh, because after a while you sit for long hours and your know, body gets a bit stiff and you uh, kind of you want to do something different uh, and it's great to do some walking meditation if you uh, as an alternative to sitting down all the time. Uh, and uh, walking meditation, the traditional way of doing it uh, is that you have a path with a certain length. It uh, doesn't have to be any particular length, maybe 30 paces or so, but whatever feels comfortable to you, really. Traditionally, 30 paces are considered kind of a suitable length. Uh, yeah, and you kind of mark it out fairly clearly. You have an end point and you have another end point. Uh, 
and you kind of walk between those two points. <coughs> this is kind of a traditional walking meditation. You walk from one end to the other one, you turn around, you walk back again, yeah? And you do that. Uh, and I would recommend you to walk at a natural pace. Uh, yeah, you don't have to kind of force yourself to walk slowly or anything like that. Uh, one of the things I always think is best in meditation practice is to do things that are natural to you and not force the situation, including the pain in the body to sit with that for long periods of time or to force yourself to walk slowly. Because as soon as you force yourself, tension tends to arise. Yeah. It's very difficult to be really relaxed if you try really hard to walk slowly. Yeah. So I wouldn't uh, walk naturally now. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, there was a, did a retreat, and there was this, this uh, uh, young woman, she was literally running back and forth. I said, walk natural, that was a natural pace. Tick, 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 I said, see, but it's okay. <laughs> so, was, uh, so some people are kind of a bit tense and stressed, perhaps, so you kind of, you have this kind of hyperactive, running back and forth. But whatever feels natural with you is fine. Uh, and uh, uh, so what do you do when you do the walking meditation? And the answer is that you can do almost anything. Uh, yeah? There isn't any kind of specific thing that you have to do. Uh, if your meditation is going well and you still want to focus on something which gives rise to samadhi or samatha, you can do that. And the traditional way of doing a samatha meditation when you walk is to watch the movement of your feet. Yeah? Feel your feet as you walk back and forth. Uh, yeah, feel, feel the motion of feet. Feel yourself touching the ground, the lifting of the feet, as much of the motion as you can. That is one way of doing it. It's not necessarily the best way. And sometimes when you've been sitting down and watching your breath for long periods, you want to do something else because meditation has kind of a natural course often. Yeah, you kind of go through, things go deeper and deeper, and then kind of plateau, as I was saying the other day, and then you come out fairly quickly afterwards. And after that, it's often not natural to go back to uh, doing more samadhi meditation straight away. You want to have it, you want to do something else when you come out in this way. Yeah. So very often, some of, one of the best things we can, or one of the things we can do is just to walk back and forth, doing nothing in particular. Yeah, yeah just kind of enjoying the peace here. Yeah. Just kind of think, well, it's you know, nice to be here. Just enjoying the good weather, enjoying, you know, this is this kind of weather. And they don't get this all the time, so you kind of... <laughs> Rejoice at the nice weather you have here, and just walk back and forth. And while you walk back and forth, uh, one of the things, as I just mentioned before, is you can just watch your mind. Uh, what is happening in your mind? Get to know yourself thoroughly. Uh, you know, what are the problems that arise uh, in the mind? Uh, sometimes in daily life, you may see that you get irritated about something, or something isn't quite right. Uh, but you don't have the mindfulness to really see the causality that happens behind that. Why are, why are things upsetting you? What is the reason? When you become a bit more peaceful on a meditation retreat, uh, you have more ability to understand the causes and the consequences, how it all works out. Uh, this is a great thing to do, uh, you know, by just walking back and forth. Uh, watch your mind. Uh, Chit that upasana if you like it, yeah? The third satipatthana or the fourth satipatthana. So look at your mind, see the causality, see how things work or don't work for you. Uh, understand what your problems are. Uh, what are the things that I need to deal with? That uh, yeah, this is kind of a very important part of the meditation practice. So, if you look at the last satipatthana, it's called the Dhamma Vipassana. It is all about precisely understanding causality. Uh, first of all, you understand the five hindrances, uh, or whichever one is maybe may present at any one particular time. Uh, then you understand the causes behind that, why they arise. Uh, yeah. Then you understand how they are abandoned and then how they remain abandoned for the future. Now, this is specifically what that is about. It's all about understanding the causality that gives rise to the problems of the mind. And this is what you can see then by just walking back and forth, doing nothing in particular. Or you can just enjoy the peace, really doing absolutely nothing. But usually uh, these things will tend to go together a little bit. Too. Or you can do meta meditation by going back and forth. Yeah kind of simple meta meditation, uh, just focusing on, uh, uh, you know, on focusing on the positive aspects of, uh, you know, of uh, beings or whatever, uh, wishing beings well, we can do that during meta meditation. Very often one thing you can do while you walk is you can do uh, a contemplation, contemplate something, contemplate death, yeah, impermanence, uh, uh, some other of the standard contemplations that we do in the Buddhist teachings. So, that's great when you're walking because the mind is often a bit more active and a bit more mobile there. Or you can think about the teachings. Maybe you have read some of the suttas or something and you can reflect on those. What do they mean to you? 
what is the, you know, how do you actually apply these things in your life? What do they, uh, what impact do they have? What, do, you know, right view or whatever it is. Uh, anything in the Buddhist teachings you can also contemplate in this way and reflect upon and try to make it uh, sink in in a deep, deeper way. Uh, this is one of those very important things. Uh, you read things superficially, but actually to really take it on board in a deep way can take a lot of reflection, yeah? You know what it's like, you read something one year, you come back the next year, like you give exactly the same teaching, suddenly you understand it in a different way. You think, wow, now I get this. Uh, actually, it's really nice. Uh, it's actually very useful. Uh, and it's like you have a small insight into uh, these teachings. Uh, and that happens very often through uh, just the exercise of reflecting on them and trying to kind of understand them in a deeper way. Yeah. So these are all ways of doing walking meditation. But the basic idea is just walk back and forth at a normal pace, turn around and walk back again there. Yeah? And it is possible to get very deep meditation during, during walking meditation. Now, one of the favorite, uh, uh, one of my kind of... <laughs> One of the things that, uh, that I sometimes mention during his retreats is that uh, Brown tells the story when he was a uh, young monk in Thailand. Uh, yeah, in Thailand, this was kind of the very early days of Wat Nam Chat, uh, the international forest monastery near Wat Pat Mongrajan Shah was staying there. And uh, in those days, they were building up the monastery. They were starting from scratch. Uh, yeah, there was nothing there. Uh, and then they had to pour the concrete in the hall themselves, the floor it was to be poured by the local villagers. Uh, now the local villagers in Thailand are, are rice farmers, yeah, they don't know anything about laying concrete. Uh, yeah, so they are rice farmers, the rice farms are pretty bumpy, so if they're going to make the concrete like the, like the rice paddy fields, uh, it's not going to be very, uh, very nice. So basically they, the local villagers had no idea how to lay concrete. It's incredibly kind of bumpy kind of hole, yeah, it was not very flat, very, very kind of uh, uh, very painful to sit on. In those days, they had no cushions. Yeah, we are pretty comfortable here. Uh, but at that time, no cushions, just a kind of a rough, really rough concrete floor. Uh. So they ended up doing quite a bit of walking meditation. Uh. And uh, uh, Adam Ram, you know, always had always been a very good meditator since the very start. You know, I think he was born like that's really unfair, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so he. <laughs> So he, uh, he does walking meditation uh, and he says he couldn't believe, you know, he, his mind becomes so peaceful. All these colors and shapes will kind of boom, explode out of the concrete. Uh, yeah? So he would see all of the things because when your meditation becomes deep, and some of you may have experienced this, your perception sometimes changes dramatically. Uh, and you see things almost as if you are on an acid trip or something like that. I don't, I've never been on an acid trip, by the way, so I, I don't know about these things, but listen to what you hear. Yeah? Kind of these incredible things that kind of occur in the meditation practice. Uh, and he said the concrete was so beautiful. Yeah, he couldn't believe it. This was the worst concrete that anyone had ever seen. And yet, to him, it was the most beautiful concrete in the world. It was just so marvelous. Colors, shapes, uh, all of these things coming out of the concrete. Uh, and the result of that is that our monastery in Perth uh, is the monastery in the world with the most concrete. Uh, yeah, because Ajahn Brown loves concrete. After his meditation experience in Thailand, he just absolutely fall in love with concrete. So we have concrete roads everywhere. You come into our monastery, absolutely everywhere. So some of you have been to our monastery, not, not that many, but some of you have. You know what it's like, concrete roads everywhere. And it's like uh, all the other monks said, please Ajahn, no more concrete roads. And that says, yes, there's only one more over here and one more <laughs> over there. Yeah. <laughs> so but this shows you how you you know, what can happen anyway in meditation practice uh, to the, you know, to the despair of all the other monks, of course, but anyway, it's, that's, that can happen in, the, <laughs> in these things. So, walking meditation can be very powerful. You read the suttas, and then was done also at the time of the Buddha. It's called Chankama in the Pali language. Uh, and uh, in the, so Chankama is, you know, you, you hear in the suttas, the monk kind of walk, pacing up and down, walking up and down. Exactly the same idea. So this was done all the way back to the time of the Buddha, basically. Yeah. Okay, so I hope that helps a little bit. Then. And um, let's uh, go on to the next one. <coughs> Dear Ajahn, uh, certainly... Uh, a, high, a very high IQ isn't necessary to reach awakening. But what are the cognitive abilities that are necessary for awakening? E.g., can a mentally 
retarded or demented person get awakened? Thank you. Are you mentally retarded? Is that what it was? <laughs> yeah, maybe a concern that you think that you're not sharp enough or something. Maybe you're slightly feel, sometimes we feel, we all feel slightly retarded sometimes, let's face it. But, uh, but that's not going to stop you from getting awakened. Can a mentally retarded person get awakened? This is an interesting question. Um, uh, it's very hard to know exactly where the limits are. I think as an animal it's, it's, it's impossible because you can't really understand the teachings. Uh, can a mentally retarded person, like if you have Down syndrome for example, could you reach awakening? You might be able to reach Samadhi, yeah, if you have Down syndrome. Why not? Why should you be able to reach Samadhi? And if you can teach them, I mean, watching the breath is pretty basic. If you can teach them that, you should be able to do so. Uh, so I don't really know. I guess, I guess maybe it's interesting from a, if you are a teacher of people like that, it might be interesting to test it out and see what happens. Uh, yeah, at the very least, if they can attain samadhi, what a wonderful thing that would be. Uh, and how, how much better their life would be as a consequence. Uh, but uh, I, as you say, you don't need to be very intelligent. Uh, so... Uh, uh, but exactly the cut-off line, I just have absolutely no idea. Obviously, you, there is a cut-off line somewhere. You have to be able to understand basic instructions, otherwise it's not going to work. Uh, but uh, I think it is. You have, I think you have a good point. You don't really have to be particularly intelligent. Uh, there is actually some stories in the suttas. Uh, there is a story of a fellow called Chulapantaka. It's not actually in the suttas. It's actually in the some later things. Some of the best stories are not actually found in the suttas. They're found in later commentaries and that sort of thing. Yeah. It's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Because, uh, uh, anyway, so the, this is a story from one of the later commentaries. I think it's the Dhammapada Antakata, the commentary of the Dhammapada, or something like that. And this uh, monk, supposed to call Shulapantaka, he's actually also found in the Vinaya. He's found in the or origin story. The, the Vinaya works, there are rules laid down for the monastics, yeah, and each rule has an origin story, because for each rule, uh, there was somebody did something silly, and then the Buddha laid down the rule. Uh, and this particular origin story, uh, this monk, Shulapantaka, uh, he was supposed to give instructions to the, to the nuns, to the bhikkhunis. Uh, every fortnight, a certain monk is supposed to give instructions to the bhikkhunis, because the bhikkhuni sangha was junior to the monk sangha, so they needed some instructions. Uh, and uh, so uh, this Chulapantaka, yeah, he, it was his turn to go to the Bikunis. Uh, and the Bikunis was saying, oh no, not Chulapantaka, he's the worst. Uh, this is going to be terrible. We really don't want to be instructed by this monk, you know. This is going to be absolutely inefficient. Uh, don't have anything to do with Chulapantaka. Uh, and then Chulapantaka comes and he starts opening his mouth and starts talking. The Bikunis said, oh no, what did we say? This is exactly what is happening here. And then Chulapantaka overheard that. Yeah, the Bikinis were complaining about his teaching here. Yeah. So he wasn't too happy with that. So what he does at that point, he rises up in the air, yeah, emits flames, walks back and forth in space, lies down, and while he does that, he utters the same verse over and over and over again. And the Bikinis go, wow, you know. Now this suddenly this verse that was so boring before suddenly it comes alive and they understand it for the first time, yeah. So, <laughs> That is the story of Chulapantaka. This is the origin story to one of the rules. Uh, and the, the particular rule is that, uh, just to kind of fill in the, the gap there, uh, the particular rule is that the monks are not supposed to teach the bhikkhunis after sunset. Uh, yeah, because the Chulapantaka, when, as soon as he rose up into the air and performed all the supernatural powers, suddenly time started to go very fast. Uh, and before you know it, the sun had gone down. And then he was told off by the Buddha for teaching the monks too long. Uh, that is how the stories are connected with rules. Uh, I, this is a very unusual story, and I think it's probably, you know, probably didn't happen that way, but anyway, that doesn't matter. It's still kind of good fun. Uh. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm take these stories with a pinch of salt, or sometimes many pinches of salt. Uh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, then, uh, this Chulapantaka, this other story about him, from the Dhammapada commentary, uh, yeah, uh, he was apparently incredibly stupid, according to the Dhammapada commentary, he couldn't remember anything, yeah, he, uh, the Buddha tried to, the, they tried to teach him, you know, simple verses to remember, he couldn't remember anything at all, except for this one verse that he taught to the Bikinis, apart from that, was, his mind was completely blank, there was nothing in there, yeah, he was able to get psychic powers, because his meditation was obviously quite good, uh, but he wasn't able to do anything apart from that, uh. so the Buddha started to, I don't think the Buddha despairs, but, you know, uh, uh, and the Buddha so, then had to figure out a skillful means to teach this monk the Dhamma. 
So he said to this monk, well, take this white cloth, yeah, he gave him a white cloth, uh, and kind of just hold this white cloth and rub this white cloth every now and again with your, with your hands, yeah, that is your job. Uh. Yeah, so the Shilapataka takes this white cloth, yeah, and he walks around with this white cloth and rubs it with his hands, uh, yeah. And then after a while, he starts to see stains appearing on the white cloth. Because if you rub the white cloth with your hand, you get dirty. It gets dirty after a while. Though. And then from that, Chulapantaka understands in exactly the same way that if you that you defile a white cloth through the wrong actions, in the same way you defile the mind through thinking in the wrong way. And that was enough for him to reach awakening. Yeah. Sounds a bit over the top to me, but anyway, that's the story. <laughs> I don't know how anyone can awaken from that, but that's the story. Yeah, that's true. The he was a complete dumb dumb. He could do anything right. All he could do was kind of have a white cloth in his hand, kind of rub the white cloth, and he could become awakened. So that means there is hope for almost anyone for each awakening. Isn't that good news? Yeah. So even if you don't feel like you are the brightest kind of a you know, spark in the world, it doesn't matter. You can still practice the path and go all the way down to awakening it. Yeah. You have Shura Pantaka too. You can take Shura Pantaka's guidance if you if you like. Yeah. So that's good news. So. Okay. Anyway, that's a bit of a sidetrack as usual, but that's how it usually things go. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. Dear Master Ramadi, if if we are to understand not self. How do we gain this insight? What types of meditation should we practice so that one can experience the factors that lead to this understanding? Thank you. Uh, if you want to understand non-self, uh, you can do that already whenever you become a little bit peaceful. I was mentioning yesterday that uh, the ideas of, uh, uh, you know, of emptiness and all of these things, uh, you understand them gradually as you become go deeper in your meditation practice. Uh, and the same thing with non-self. As you, uh, you know, when you emerge from meditation or you go deeper in your meditation, certain things fall away. The body starts to fall away, the senses start to fall away, hindrances, certain perceptions fall away, certain feelings fall away. You're left with just happiness sometimes, all the pain is gone. So you know that all of those things that have disappeared, they must be non-self. If, it, if, it, if they were a self, uh, there would have to be a, anything which is a permanent essence always has to be there. If you can't access those things anymore, if they're beyond your control, it means that they can't be part of yourself. Uh, and this is how you start to get uh, uh, an insight, an understanding of these things. Uh, yeah? It's a gradual kind of a, um, a gradual arising of, a, of, of these things. Uh. But the real insight into non-self, the only way you can really get this, is through profound samadhi. You have to have really deep meditation for this insight to happen. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, uh, it is so counterintuitive, it is so counter to our normal experience, uh, that it would often seem frightening. Yeah? You're giving up something which seems so close to you. Uh, it is just an illusion, so it's not a reality. You're not actually giving up anything at all. Uh, but that illusion it creates fear because you're giving up something which seems to be yours, uh, seems to be some, something very close to you. It seems like you're giving up your identity, yeah, who you are. Uh. So because of that, you need a mind which is very powerful uh, and able to deal with that kind of situation. Uh. And that mind is really a mind in samadhi which is able to, to do that. Uh. So full experience of non-self uh, really only happens after samadhi. The more profound the samadhi is, uh, the more ability you have to deal with uh, uh, that kind of profound insight and take it on board uh, as, uh, you know, as it happens. Uh. So, uh, but, uh, yeah. But it's often these things are kind of a long way down the track, yeah? So in the meantime, just uh, enjoy the meditation in the meantime uh, and eventually you will get there if you keep on going. Uh. Okay, does anyone who gets awakened get insight into past lives? And is anyone who gets insight into the past lives uh, is on the path to awakening? Yeah. Does anyone who gets awakened get insight about that? Sure, yeah, the Buddha, he yeah, was one of those. He got awakened, he had insight into past lives. Uh, so anyone who gets awakened gets insight about that? But, uh, not, do you mean everyone or anyone? If you mean everyone, uh, does 
That's a different question. Does everyone who gets a working get insight into the past life? The answer is still yes. But maybe not quite in the way that you think it, because uh, insight into past lives uh, is there's two kinds of insights. Uh, and one is the insight which is the recollection of past lives, uh, when you actually see what happened in the past directly. Yeah? This is one type of insight. Uh, but the other type of insight is the causal principle that Craving leads to rebirth, and that is insight into dependent origination. That is a different type of insight. It's an understanding of causality, how things kind of hang together. Yeah, one is more like an inferential insight, if you like. Uh, we have an inference, the other one is a direct experience of things. Uh, so th these are two different ways of getting insight into the idea of rebirth. Uh, yeah, so everyone has the one where the, you know that craving leads to rebirth, uh, but not everyone who is awakened has the uh, experiential uh, uh, experience of actually remembering the past lives. Uh, some do, but not everyone. Uh. Um, is anyone who gains insight into past lives, are they on the path to awakening? Yes. So, uh, if uh, again, there's two types of insights. Yeah, if you have the uh, insight into how craving leads to rebirth, uh, that is that uh, happens when you become a stream entry. Yeah? A stream entry is someone who actually has direct understanding of dependent origination. Uh, happens at that point. That is the point when you see the Dhamma. This is what the uh, stream entry is all about. You see the Dhamma and then the path gets internalized and then the path happens automatically from there on. Uh, uh, also, if you do remember your past lives more in the sense of a real recollection of past lives, uh, yeah, if that is what you, uh, what you mean in this case, uh, that too, of course, is a very powerful aid to awakening. Because once you see your past lives, you see this whole spectrum of lives going on, well, you actually start to get insight into suffering. Yeah? This is what this is about. Uh, yeah? Seeing past lives means, wow, this is scary, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah? Yeah, going around, up and down, back and forth, not going anywhere, roaming around, as it says in the Sutta. It? To roam, the English word roam, means like random movement. You have no purpose, no direction of going anywhere. You're just roaming around. After a while, you get fed up with roaming around. Not going anywhere, not having any direction, not any sense of purpose. You wonder, what am I doing this for? Yeah, this is kind of what you see when you see your past life to some extent. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, dear Adam, could you please explain the right effort as explained by the Buddha? I can't understand how not to allow unwholesome thoughts before they come into your head. Okay, so how to stop unwholesome thoughts before they come into your head. Okay, uh, please explain. So where do you think they come from? They come from the outside? They come from go through your ears or your mouth or something, bang, into your head, and then you, you have them. Uh, um, they actually they kind of arise inside your head, yeah? they kind of arise uh, from within, basically. This is the problem with these unwholesome thoughts. So, um, I will talk about this quite a bit later on, because this is a very important part of the path to deal with unwholesome thinking. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this. Uh, but ba the basic idea is that uh, uh, you have, first of all, you have to have enough mindfulness uh, to be aware of what is happening. Yeah? And if you have a lot of mindfulness, very often you can see that the causes are coming into place. Uh, you know that now unwholesome thoughts are about to arise. Uh, and the most important unwholesome thoughts to, uh, to, uh, uh, to keep out uh, are ill will, anger, and these kind of things. Because these are so destructive. Uh, and also very disruptive of your meditation practice. So focus on those unwholesome thoughts. And don't worry so much about the other ones. Uh, yeah, so the first thing is to have enough mindfulness to see that if I continue you know, uh, observing this particular object or whatever, it's only a matter of time before ill will is going to arise. Because this I know from past experience. This give, gives rise to upset in me. I get angry about, about these things. So uh, that is the first thing. Yeah. And once you have enough awareness to realize what is happening here, then you have to have a strategy, yeah, a tactic to get away from that. Uh, and often it is quite simple. Often all you have to do is to you know, look at something else, uh, look at that object in a different way, uh, 
Yeah, I see some other aspect of that object. Uh, look in a different direction. Remind yourself of the dangers in this. Uh, these are some of the methods that you use to direct yourself in a different direction. Uh, and we we'll look at this in much more detail later on, but that is a kind of a rough outline uh, of how you deal, how you deal with these things. Uh, so that is the, uh, uh, the trick. It's not that hard to do. It's surprisingly, I, I, if you really are committed to Buddhist practice uh, and you really want to do this, uh, it is not that difficult to do. Uh, is this kind of fading out a little bit? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> Sound a bit dodgy. Uh? Do you have another battery in it? <laughs> well, I do, but they just changed the list. This has, yeah, they want to change it again then? Or no, no, no. Is this working yet? Yeah. Actually, I wasn't the person who changed the batteries, so I... Yeah, we have the older one there. Okay. Well, then I can try a bit more if you have. Should we find one? Just a little bit. It's rather good, yeah. It's something I was looking for, actually. It's something wrong with that. Mm. I think you're right, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> 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 no, I mean it's not the batteries because yeah, we, we changed yeah, batteries yeah. this mo this morning was it? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And she, she put in new batteries. Okay. I don't think it's the batteries. That's the, okay. Yeah. What what do we do now? I don't think we I think we use it without. Yeah. I yeah. Think it's probably better. Okay. Yeah. She said yeah. that maybe we can charge this one, but I don't know if you want to ask her about that tomorrow. Yeah, she will be late tomorrow. There will be another lady, but I can ask her. Yeah, yeah sure. This she thinks it's not Those two are connected, yeah. No, they're, I think they're different. This is the clip-on one. Are those new batteries? Uh -huh. They are new. Batteries. Yeah, they're new batteries inside. The ones you have in mm -hmm. These, yeah, because well, I have recording machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, dear Mante, please, could you say a little more about the benefits uh, and the joys of monastic life? Uh, may I also say how wonderful the period is in every way? Thank you. Okay, that's nice. Now it's getting better again, I think. I think we have a, have a problem there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to come with your magic hands and touch it maybe and see if you can <laughs> Uh, I hope you can hold it, that's right. Uh, so, uh, the uh, idea, uh, the, the monastic life, one of the benefits of monastic life uh, is that <laughs> <laughs> the microphones always work, that's kind of the, no, they, they don't always work yet. Can everyone, can you hear me well then? I usually have, a, usually have a fairly strong voice, so usually people can hear me here. But if I can't, just raise your hand and I will see if I can raise my voice as high as you raise your hand uh, and see what happens. <laughs> So uh, the idea of uh, monastic life, one of the uh, you know, very important things on the Buddhist path is the idea of Kalyana Mitta. Uh, Kalyana Mitta means spiritual friendship. Uh, and in monastic life, you have often the best of spiritual friendship. Yeah, if you are in a good monastery, you have a good teacher like we have down in Perth, someone like Ajahn Brahm, uh, who obviously has a lot of experience in meditation and who, who is in many ways, has a lot of very powerful spiritual qualities. Uh, yeah, he becomes an example for how you practice, he becomes a spiritual friend, uh, very often just by osmosis. Uh, this may sound surprise, surprising, maybe you think that the idea of a spiritual teacher is to always teach you, to tell you what to do, uh, but very often you don't need to say very much. Uh, the idea is that when you are around somebody uh, and you see how they act, how they live their life, uh, it's like you take it on board, yeah? it kind of just seeps through your skin somehow. Yeah, you kind of become a mini Ajahn Brahm after a while. Eh? <laughs> so if you see me do things that are weird and looks a bit like Ajahn Brahm, then you know why. There's too much osmosis is happening here. That's what is happening there. Eh? So uh, that is one of the very important things. And of course, when you are around other monastics all the time, eh, you're always reminded of Buddhism. You have like-minded people who always practice like you. Eh? You don't have to go to work and, you know, people have to tell them, what are you doing? You're doing some weird stuff, aren't you? What is this Buddhist stuff all about? Uh, don't have to worry about that at all, ye
as long as you enjoy the company of those people, as long as you feel at ease in that monastery, it actually works really well in this way. Yeah. So this is one of the things about monastic life. Yeah. The other thing which is great about monastic life uh, is that uh, you have very good support uh, for your spiritual practice. Uh, you have a little kuti, a little hut in the forest, uh, yeah, where you hang out by yourself. Uh, and how easy is that in ordinary life to get a little kuti in the forest? Uh, and then people come every day to the monastery and bring you food. Uh, and all you have to do is hang out in your kuti and the food just comes. Uh, yeah? As Ram says, we have meals on wheels. They come from the <laughs> drive into the monastery, bang, they give you the food. Uh, and what is so astonishing about this is a very, you know, from, from, from the perspective of the monastic, it is absolutely, it is very touching actually what is going on. All these people, we have maybe in our monastery in Perth, I would say a minimum of 30 visitors every day here. They come and bring food to the monastery. Sometimes you have a thousand visitors, sometimes it's down to maybe 30. Yeah, a thousand is quite rare because it, it just the monastery doesn't, can't really fit that many people. Uh, but they come every day. They come with you know, large amounts of very, very high quality, very nice food. Uh, they uh, offer uh, this food to the monastics. Uh, and when they, are, uh, off they have offered the food to the monastics, uh, they go down and they do the dishes. Yeah, they clean up after, after everything as well. Uh, and after they have given, done the dishes and cleaned everything up, then they go and put a donation in the donation box. Uh, <laughs> pretty good deal, isn't it? <laughs> it's astonishing how this actually works. It's such a, it's such a beautiful thing, and when you see this, it actually makes you, uh, if you have the right attitude as a monastic, it makes you actually really want to practice, uh, because you realize people do this because they have a certain faith that, that you're living in the right way. Uh, and you see all this beautiful generosity coming into the monastery. It actually makes you want to uh, fulfill, if you like, your side of the bargain to actually make sure that you live the monastic life in the right way. Huh? But it really is very touching how, uh, some, how people actually look after you as a monastic. And it's true pretty much everywhere where you travel around the world. Up here, all I have to do, up <coughs> here I sit in my room upstairs, yeah? <coughs> Not all the time, but I sit up there. And sometimes when I open the door, there's a bar of chocolate there, just coming out of nowhere. There's nothing cheap, is, you know? This is what it's like to be a monk. Chocolate just comes out of nowhere, the little day must come up. Drop the chocolate there, and bang, there I am. I have a nice chocolate for the afternoon and for the evening here. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It doesn't happen to most people, yeah? But if you are a monk or nun, these things happen. Yeah. Is that a good reason to become a monk or nun? It's actually, it is not a bad reason, because it is a very beautiful to be able to see the wholesome qualities in other people all the time. Yeah. It is very encouraging and very, uh, very uplifting to see that. So actually, it is, a, it is actually a very good reason for doing it. Yeah. But what it basically means is that in monastic life, uh, you have optimal conditions for being able to practice the path. Uh, yeah? uh, all the work we do in monastic life is charity work. Uh, we do, of course, a lot of, uh, quite a bit of building work in our monastery, maintenance work and that sort of thing. Uh, and that is always charity. Yeah? I, we don't get a salary for this. Uh, so whenever I do any kind of work, I always think of how I benefit uh, Buddhism in the broader sense. Uh, and this is what I think also when I give a, you know, come somewhere and I give a retreat or I give talks or whatever, I always think about how I'm trying to benefit the world by doing these things. Uh, and when you do something out of a sense of generosity and kindness, uh, it always has powerful benefits back in return. Uh, you always feel good about yourself afterwards uh, because you feel that you have tried to help other people. And even if I don't help you guys, yeah, even if you kind of you, you don't feel that you have helped you, still yeah, I feel like that, yeah, I'm still happy. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you kind of think, what is he talking about, you know, I, I, I'm still happy inside, yeah. So for me, it is still good. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so um, that is this is these are some of the great things about being a monastic, yeah? and these are some of the things that is almost impossible to find anywhere in the world apart from in the Buddhist monastic life. Uh, Another thing that you get from being a monastic is that you get to uh, live in a secluded place in the forest. Uh, and people all, often underestimate the importance of coming out of the city, getting a, away from your ordinary life uh, and living somewhere far away. It's actually very important. Uh, yeah, and it's important because obviously to get away from the noise of society and the problems in society. Uh, it's also important to extract yourself a little bit from the sensual pleasures of the world. Uh, if you live in the city or you live in a town or whatever, the sensual impressions are so powerful. Huh? 
Yeah, what is the purpose of a city? Yeah, what is the purpose of living in London, for example? The purpose is to enjoy yourself. Everything is about enjoyment. There's the theater here, the movies here, the kind of music scene, yeah, all of this stuff going on around you. You go to the cafes, this is where you date people, you find your latest boyfriend or girlfriend, yeah, and, all of, and you have nice restaurants everywhere. Yeah. This is what the city life is about. Uh, but when you withdraw to the forest, uh, you actually allow your mind to dry out a little bit of all those sensual pleasures, uh, so that you can actually allow that to, to go a little bit. Uh, it's very difficult when you are in the midst of it all the time, uh, but by withdrawing from that, uh, you're actually able to, uh, to let go of those things to some extent. Uh, so this is why forest monasteries are so important, and why they're still so useful in the world. Uh, one of the astonishing things that the Buddha says, this is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, this is the last, uh, you know, the last travels of the Buddha before he finally passes away in Kushinara. At the beginning of the sutta, he lays down where he says the things that will uh, enable Buddhism to, to uh, uh, be around for a long time into the future. Yeah? The things that will lead to the increase of the Buddhist teachings and not to their decline, to their support and not to their fading away. And he gives seven things uh, that leads to the support of Buddhism in the future, to its increase uh, and not to its decline. Uh. And one of those seven things uh, is that the monastics enjoy living in the forest. Uh. Yeah, this shows you how important forest dwelling actually is in Buddhist teaching. Sometimes we think, yeah, it doesn't matter so much whether you live in the city or the forest, as long as the monastics live well and do the right thing, whether you are a monastic or a layperson, but actually it matters enormously. The entire future of Buddhism actually relies on monastics or enjoy forest dwellings. Yeah, one of seven factors. This shows you how important this is. Another example from the suttas is the example of where the Buddha is walking around, he's kind of looking at his monks, and he's walking around and he sees this monk sitting on the edge of the village, yeah, sitting very straight getting some nice some samadhi perhaps, sitting straight and doing very well. Eh? And then, very surprisingly, the Buddha says about this monk, eh, I'm not happy with this monk. Eh? And then he goes off into the forest and he sees this other monk in the forest and this monk is sitting there, <laughs> nodding away in the forest, yeah, dozing away and kind of half asleep but not really, kind of meditation obviously not going so well. Eh? And then the Buddha says, surprisingly, I'm really happy with this monk. Eh? It's, ca it's counterintuitive, yeah? Most people think, as long as you get good meditation, it doesn't matter where it is. If it's in the village, whatever, you're getting good meditation, that's good enough. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter where it is. This is what the Buddha is saying here. He then says that this monk who is sitting on the outskirts of the village, uh, because he's sitting in the wrong place, uh, it won't be long before people come and disturb him. Yeah, and then once he disturb, is disturbed, he will lose the samadhi. Uh, Whereas the monk who is sitting in the forest, because he is sitting in the right place, uh, he will overcome his tiredness, uh, and when he overcomes his tiredness, then his samadhi will be good, and he won't be disturbed by anybody. Uh. So it actually matters. It's not just what we are doing. It is about the long-term consequences of how we live that are important. Uh, yeah? So where you do it actually matters enormously. Uh. And this is why the idea of forest dwellings are so important. Uh. And it's very inspiring. Sometimes we hear stories about uh, monks who live in Sri Lanka, for example. I know some of the monks in Sri Lanka, uh, and they live in very simple dwellings far away in the jungle. Uh, yeah, and they live like that for years, for decades on end. And uh, you know the only way they will be, can be able to do that is because <coughs> the meditation is going well. Uh, yeah, that's the only way you can live happily far away in the jungle. Uh, year after year after year, and not go completely bananas, uh, the only way you can do that <laughs> yeah, is, by, uh, is basically by having good meditation practice. There's no other way of doing it. Uh. And uh, so it's actually quite inspiring when you hear those stories, uh, and there are quite a few of those stories around. Uh. So um, these are some of the benefits of monastic life. Monastic life is actually, in many ways, if you approach it in the right way, uh, it is very, it's a very beautiful way to live, uh, and a very... Uh, uh, inspiring way to live. Uh, not always, uh, and this is also one of the things you have to remember that monastics are also people like everyone else. Uh, so you have the problems in monastic life that you also have in, in the rest of society. Uh, yeah, it is always going to be there, there's always going to be some friction, always some problems. Uh, but uh, the overall picture is very positive, the overall picture is very supportive. Uh, that enables you to deal with difficult situations and things. Uh. 
So there you are. That's the kind of rose-tinted glasses view of uh, <laughs> monastic life. Yeah, sound good, huh? Yeah, if you are, I, I'll, I'll see how good a salesman I am. If people line <laughs> up after the retreat to have the headshed, then I know I've gone to solve it well. So we'll see how things go. Huh? <laughs> okay. So, next one. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Venerable sir, does having a cup of clear soup after hours violate the sixth precept? Uh, are dark chocolate and cheese permissible and why? Thank you. Um, these are kind of, uh, you know, this is really depends on how you interpret some of these things. Uh, and a cup of clear soup is usually considered like a medicine in the in the vinaya. In the vinaya, if you feel like you need a little bit of support, yeah, especially if you are a little bit ill or maybe whatever, then clear soup broth is actually allowable. Yeah, bean broth or meat broth, in there, especially when if you feel a little bit sick, it is actually perfectly okay. Yeah. So if you have a little bit of clear soup in the in the evening, yeah, I, I, no, I I would say from my point of view, absolutely no problem. I, as a monastic, I don't take it, but uh, if you want to take that, uh, it's, it's not an issue as far as I'm concerned. Uh. Dark chocolate and cheese, are they permissible and why? And the reason why these are permissible or semi-permissible uh, uh, is because at the time of the Buddha, the monks sometimes needed some tonics, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, uh, things to pick them up a little bit in the evening. Maybe they were a little bit sick or they had a little bit of problems and hadn't had enough to eat or whatever it was. Uh. So the Buddha said, well, these are five types of food that you are allowed to have in the afternoon if you feel there is a need. And those types of food are sugar, oil, honey, uh, uh, honey what is it? ghee, and navanita. Navanita is one of these things we don't know what actually what is it, but it's often interpreted to mean cheese. And that's why cheese is because <laughs> 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 Sounds, sounds a bit random, doesn't it? Yeah, Navanita, okay. What, now, what can, how can we interpret this in the most kind of convenient way? Yeah? It's, <laughs> but it is, it is a milk product, and it is in the vicinity of cheese. Yeah? It's kind of close, but it is a product that they uh, made in India two and a half thousand years ago. It's probably not exactly cheese, but it's kind of close enough. So you say cheese is acceptable. That's how it works. Nothing is ever perfect in this world. Uh. So, and dark chocolate, because it consists mostly of oil, yeah, fats, fats and oil, same thing, sugar, and uh, cocoa powder is actually co considered an allowed, a lifetime medicine in Buddhism. Anything which are kind of, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, peppercorns or anything which is not edible food, uh, uh, but which serves as some kind of medicine and medicinal requisites, and these things were used like that in those days, uh, any kind of leaves and any kind of uh, fruits that are not solid, Edible fruits uh, can serve in this way as, uh, as medicines. Uh, so basically, it comes out of the vinaya. That's why these things are allowable in this way. So you just put them together in a new way, and then you, dark, you say dark chocolate is allowable. Uh, do you th does it sound like cheating? Is that what it sounds like? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit, a bit unhealthy sometimes, yeah? All this dark chocolate and cheese and the I'm not sure it's a good idea. We don't have cheese in our monastery at Bodhinyana. We don't have cheese in the afternoon at all, uh, because... Uh, it is uh, perhaps a little bit too much. Uh, uh, and uh, chocolate, yes, we have that available, uh, but uh, you know, uh, uh, we try to kind of be reasonable about it. Uh, does that sound good? Uh, sound okay, uh, acceptable. <laughs> Sometimes we make too much out of these little things. These are just kind of minor things. Uh, whether you eat chocolate in the afternoon or you don't, uh, it's kind of, you know, it's not going to stop you from getting enlightened, that's for sure. Uh, so it's kind of, it doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, some people might say it's not allowable, some say it's allowable. It's one of those things that sometimes, you know, monks argue about. Uh, sometimes the things you argue about are the most insignificant things. Uh, and it's kind of sometimes a bit silly. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't take those things too seriously. Uh, try not to anyway. Uh. Okay. Next one. Dear Ajahn, I am not 90, but I am 64. Okay. <laughs> now that I have discharged my household responsibilities, have I missed the boat to train as a monastic? I'm in good health and still work full-time in a high-powered job. Big meta. Okay, you're not 90, you're 64. Have you, have you kind of uh, missed the train? Uh, not necessarily. It depends which train you want to board. So you may have missed, missed, missed some trains. 
<laughs> but uh, our our particular monastery, we tend to be quite uh, uh, open-minded at that, uh, accepting people who also are not necessarily very young. Yeah, some monasteries have kind of very clear age limits. If you're over 45 already, it's already too late. Yeah, they say 45. Some even say 40. Others have higher limits. So it depends on the monastery what they feel kind of comfortable with. Uh, but uh, it is not impossible to ordain if you are 64. It is not even impossible to ordain when you are 90, but it may, you may find it a bit challenging if you're 19. Eh? But uh, it is not impossible. Eh? It is uh, difficult, however. It is the older you are, the more difficult is, it is often to adjust to monastic life. Because uh, as you get older, you tend to become a little bit less flexible. Eh? Yeah, when I look at some of the monks in our monastery who ordained when they were old, sometimes I kind of you know, I, I see what they would have meant when they said that all the people are less flexible. That's what I. <laughs> that's what I yeah, and you, you try to tell them, like, maybe I shouldn't do this. And they say, oh, yes, 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 and do exactly the same thing the next day. Yeah, that's kind of. Okay, so, okay, let's let it be. Huh? It is more difficult to adjust as you get older. Huh? And I think yeah, this is something probably most people uh, can, can see. So, it is not too late, and it is very individual. Some people adjust, w- adjust reasonably well, even if they're older. Huh? So you're certainly most welcome to try it and uh, check it out uh, and see if it, uh, if it is something you can do. Okay, the Ajahn, in the Buddha's time, there seemed to be uh, a large number of Arahants, uh, which nowadays does not seem to be the case anymore. What are the reasons? Uh, and the reasons, I say the reason is the Abhidhamma, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it is... <laughs> It's, it's very interesting, yeah, the, the, the number of books you have, uh, yeah, is inversely proportional to the number of arahants. Uh. So the more books you have, the less arahants you have. The more, less arahants you have, the more books you have. The more books get written, uh, the less arahants you have. This seems to be the case. Uh. There is an inversely proportional relationship between the number of books and the number of arahants. Uh. And uh, uh, so, and the... Uh, so, I, I, you know, when I say it is because of the Abhidhamma, I'm not 100% joking, there's some truth to that. Uh, and uh, the more scholastic kind of the traditions tend to become, the more the focus is on uh, keeping, you know, the tradition alive through scholasticism, very often the practice actually gets lost out of the window as a consequence. Uh, but it is a natural thing, and the Buddha actually says so in the sutta, that the Dhamma, it gradually declines, yeah? It gradually goes down and down and down, uh, until eventually it is lost completely here. Yeah. So this is what we should really expect, uh, yeah? A kind of gradual decline of things. Uh. And uh, the uh, exact causes for that, well, I think, you know, initially the causes were that uh, Buddhism got uh, supported by some very powerful people, like King Ashoka supported Buddhism, uh, and of course, as soon as it gets supported with a little bit too much money, that is the way that Buddhism gets corrupted. Huh? This is happening in the Buddhist world in the very present day. Huh? If you go to places like, you know, fairly wealthy Buddhist countries like Thailand, for example, huh? everybody wants to give to the forest monks. Huh? Yeah, because everybody wants to give to the forest monks because they think that the forest monks, that's where the real practice is happening. Huh? They get corrupted very quickly. Huh? Yeah, I want to build you a palace. Can I please build you a palace? Because I want to make lots of merit. Huh? And the forest monk thinks, yeah, my meditation hasn't been going so good recently. Listen, maybe a palace would come in handy. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so we build, build, build a palace. And sometimes when you see some of these so-called kutis that some of these monks live in, you think, gee, the scribbles, lay people don't have houses like this, so, you know? It is very, very fancy. Yeah. So as a lay person, it is important to know the balance in giving. Giving what is right, giving what is suitable, not giving over the top, but what actually is suitable for a monastic. Yeah. And usually in the West it's not a problem, uh, yeah, because in the West people uh, haven't got that kind of idea of making merit that you have in places like Thailand, because we haven't got those uh, Buddhist institutions in quite the same way. So in the West it's not usually a problem. So in Australia it doesn't really happen. Yeah? We get good support, but not kind of, you know, we don't build this kind of, these kind of things for ourselves. So. But in Thailand, it certainly does happen a lot. And that tends to corrupt the Sangha, because it's very easy yeah, to slide, to go backwards in these things. very easy to slowly get corrupted. It's very hard sometimes even to avoid it. But if we work together as monastics and lay people uh, and try to do the right thing, then usually you're able to avoid these kind of things. Uh. But uh, it is true, you know, Buddhism is, uh, I think, even now, still in decline. Uh, 
yeah, the number of arahants still going down in the world. Are, are there any arahants left in the present day? I think there are some, but not many. They're kind of, you know, you can't, uh, how many are they? Are they countable on one hand or two hands? That's kind of the question we have. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's almost like that. Uh, not many people left to have insight into the Dhamma. And uh, it's a good thing to remind ourselves of that, because when you remember that, uh, it actually means that you feel a sense of urgency in the practice. Uh, this is always useful because it can be very hard to find that motivation sometimes to get us going and things. So, uh, yes? Uh, next one. Okay, I have been hearing reports that it is easy to attain stream entry by doing the Burmese Vipassana meditation. E.g. Mahasa technique says, uh, one in 25 students will attain stream entry during a three-month retreat. <laughs> if the Buddhist teacher Deepa Ma and her whole family attain this within a few years. <coughs> Your thoughts, please. My thoughts is that I think it was my friend Ajahn Sujato, he called the problem with the Mahasa technique, he called it a rampant institutionalized overestimation. <laughs> yeah, rampant institutionalized overestimation. That's what he called it. And uh, this is the problem with some of these techniques. Yeah, they give you a certificate, say that you are a stream entry after the course, uh, and very often it's nothing like it. Uh, I can assure you that this is. Uh, it, I have had people come to me. Yeah, I've had uh, uh, ask me. Oh, you know, I was told by these the pastor that I'm a stream entry, but I don't believe it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe you are a streamer, I can guarantee you absolutely certain you are not a streamer. There's actually no way, no chance in the world. Stream entry is an extraordinarily powerful experience. If you are a stream entry, you know something has happened. Yeah, something profound has happened. If you doubt it, uh, yeah, usually people start to feel very proud. Yeah, I'm a stream entry. That's usually what happens. <laughs> but if you doubt it, uh, which is obviously a good thing in the first place, guaranteed you're not a stream entry. So I know from my personal experience, that a lot of that is just complete nonsense. Uh, people have some kind of experience in the meditation, it gets interpreted as stream entry, but actually it's not, not, none of the, uh, uh, nothing like it at all. Uh. So uh, take this again with a massive pinch of salt. When you hear these kind of things, uh, one in 25 students become a stream entry, it already sounds dodgy to me. You just, just kind of, that kind of statistic already <laughs> is kind of, you know, out of the, uh, uh, is not, not really very trustworthy. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the easiest way to attain stream entry is to follow the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, that is the way to get there. If you are a Vipassana meditator and you follow the Noble Eightfold Path, you will get there. If you are not a Vipassana meditator but you follow the Noble Eightfold Path, you will still get there. It is not the name of the method is kind of irrelevant. Uh, you can call it what you like. Very often, Vipassana meditation, they start out with watching the breath and then watching the feelings in the body or whatever. It is not that different from just the ordinary Anapanasati practice. The Buddha talks about his most important method of meditation is Anapanasati, because that is what the Buddha teaches. I think that is the safest bet to reach awakening. Yeah, take, let's take the Buddha as our uh, adv main advisor, not, uh, you know, Mahasi Sayadaw, probably a very good monk. I don't know that much about him. Uh, and probably his method probably works for some. Uh, but I would still prefer to go back to the uh, method used by the Buddha. There is a lot of uh, Abhidhamma and Visuddhimagga involved in the Mahasi method. Uh, and uh, I prefer to go back to the more basic teachings found uh, in the suttas themselves. So. Okay. Please don't tell anyone in the Mahasa tradition what I said because I might get into serious trouble. <laughs> okay, dear Ajahn Brahmali, I am married uh, to a sculptor, sculptor, painter of beautiful young ladies since 1980. Okay, so I have to be very understanding. He, uh, he, he is impatient in speech and behavior. Okay. Okay, so, okay, it does not let me explain matters often after three words, things I have said all already. Uh, he tends to be very repetitive, always uh, 
only sees things black and white. My blood pressure is at dangerous levels. <laughs> Practice uh, breathing meditation always. Help! <laughs> the last one here. Okay, so um, help you. Okay. Oh, this is a rather interesting note. I'm not sure exactly where to start, <laughs> start with this. Um, well, if you, you know, if you find that your uh, marriage is very difficult, yeah, and if it is, I, 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 it's very hard for me to know exactly how difficult it is based on what you're saying here, but obviously you're having some problems, otherwise you wouldn't be writing this. Uh, if it is, uh, you know, if it really causes you a lot of suffering and problems, uh, it is always, you know, there's nothing in Buddhism that says we cannot divorce. Uh, divorce is always a possibility if you find that it is unbearable the situation you are in. Uh, so, but often it is better, sometimes we divorce, then we get married again and find someone worse. That often happens as well. Then. <laughs> so sometimes if we can resolve the situation as it is, it, often it is even better. Uh, yeah? So if you can use Dhamma principles uh, to be understanding, to kind of make it somehow work out, uh, it is even preferable because very often uh, you will actually grow in the process uh, as, as you do that. Uh, yeah, so if you are able to grow through the process, then of course it will be benefit, win-win situation, both for yourself and for your husband. Huh? But if you do feel it is too oppressive, if you feel that you are kind of losing your spiritual life as a consequence of the difficulties of your marriage and your husband or whatever it is, uh, it is always acceptable to say enough is enough. At the very least we can say, let's try a period of separation to see if it is better that way. And then sometimes, because of absence makes the heart grow fonder, you may find out maybe the marriage wasn't so bad after all. Uh, so uh, uh, it is really, um, you know, there isn't any kind of absolute answer to these things. Uh, try a few different things and see if you can find something that works for you. Uh, in the end, you should always give your spiritual life priority because that is what really matters in the world. Uh, you should ensure that you're able to grow in spiritual qualities, uh, whether that is by staying there or by leaving or by whatever. Uh, that is not so important. Uh, but you should find a way by which you can continue growing in spiritual qualities. Uh. Gee, this is uh, bad news with so many enormous number of questions, but I'm going too, too slowly today. Okay. Dear Ajahn, what exactly is consciousness? Is it a form of energy? And where is it? In the mind, brain, or some, or some say even in the heart? Also, why is consciousness the leading factor in the Buddhist path? Uh, are we using the breath to get into the consciousness so that we can, uh, we can observe it? Uh, thank you. Uh, consciousness is... In the Buddhist idea, the word consciousness is used different ways in the English language. Yeah, it's used in many ways, but one, this is more like the philosophical uses of consciousness, it just means awareness. Yeah, the ability to know something. Yeah. Why do you know anything at all? It's because you have con consciousness, you have awareness, it's the ability to know. It's the most basic aspect of the mind. Yeah, if you almost subtract everything else, you kind of purify, you're making consciousness more and more rarefied as you subtract things. You go deeper and deeper into samadhi, consciousness is always there, no matter how deep you go into samadhi. It's always present. So consciousness is the, the most basic thing in, uh, in experience. Apart from consciousness, uh, you know, the standard way uh, of the Buddhist analysis of experience is that we have feelings. Uh, with everything, we have a degree of feelings, yeah, it is either positive or negative or neutral. We perceive things, our perception is our way of making sense of the world, yeah, so you see here carpet, mats, ceilings, people, and all of these kind of things. We make sense of the world, there is the will, which is our ability to have agency to actually get things done, and then there is consciousness, and there is also rupa, which is like form, yeah, the shape of things and these kind of things. So consciousness is one of the most basic things in, in experience. Uh, where is it? Well, it's wherever your mind is. That's where consciousness is. Uh, yeah? So if you have a mind, if you have experience, right there is where consciousness is. Uh. So you could say, very often you could say that your mind is roughly, fills up roughly the same space as your body. Uh, 
Why is that? Because you can feel your body. Yeah? If you can feel your body, you know your mind must also be there. Yeah? Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to feel it. Yeah? As soon as you go outside of the body, well, then that, that's where your mind kind of stops. Yeah? So roughly has the same boundary as your body, your mind. Yeah? It's not just in your head. It, it fills the same space as the body. Yeah? Um, uh, the leading factor on the body, it's not really the leading factor, uh, it is like the most profound aspect of personal experience. Uh, so if you want to find and understand personal experience fully, you also have to understand consciousness. Uh, yeah, You have to see consciousness as non-self, you have to see awareness itself as non-self, uh, and this is kind of the pro most profound insight you can have on the Buddhist path. Uh. Uh, and yes, you can use the breath to, to get there, yeah? so you can observe the consciousness, indeed, uh, that is what in, in, in the end it is what it's all about. Uh, so you observe consciousness coming and going here, yeah? you observe consciousness in the different senses, yeah? from one sense to another one, you observe the differences in those kinds of consciousness, uh, and when you see that there is a distinction between the consciousness of the various senses, uh, then you realize that actually consciousness itself is granular. Uh, it is arises and passes away. It is discrete. It is a, a phenomenon which disappears completely and then re-arises again afterwards. <coughs> that is the deep insight into consciousness. Uh, yeah, I hope that was what you were asking. I wasn't entirely sure. Uh, uh, let's just do one more question and then we're going to have to leave the rest the other ones for tomorrow i hope you don't mind that too much um maybe what we should do uh, rudita are you in charge of the questions are you uh, the question boss mm -hmm. what, do you mean by what, 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 I, what i mean is that maybe what we could do is to put these questions to one side so i can do those first then we can okay, put them sure, sure. next ones yeah, afterwards so yeah that'd be all right yeah, yeah. okay great so yeah uh, okay, dear Ajahn, if negative thoughts are in the mind, do we sit with them uh, with acceptance and compassion? Uh, if not, what do we do with them if we can't ignore them? Uh, so, uh, this, these are some of the most important questions about meditation practice. Uh, how do we deal with negative thoughts, in particular <coughs> thoughts that have to do with ill will and harming, that sort of stuff? Uh, they are very destructive meditation practice. Uh, and very important to deal with those skillfully. Huh? <coughs> so as I was saying before, the first thing is to be aware that the thought is arising. Huh? So if your mindfulness is going reasonably well while you're meditating, you will be able to see them happening fairly early on. Yeah, You can see things starting to come, and then you can deal with it fairly fast. That is often one of the most important things, uh, to kind of get at them at the beginning. Huh? Now, there, often there are recurring thoughts, yeah, recurring negative thoughts, uh, certain people that we have problems with and they kind of come back into our, our mind yeah you've gone all the way to the peak district extracted yourself from your ordinary life and then these people come back into your mind yeah even though you've gone so far away oh no i've gone so many kilometers away and still they come back into mind you know what i'm talking about yeah kind of there you know it's kind of obsessive we kind of deal with these things <laughs> So uh, uh, what you have to do is, uh, one of the things the Buddha, this is a beautiful sutta called the uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta, which is the calming of thoughts, uh, especially the thoughts which are unwholesome. Uh, and he says that in there, that if you uh, have a negative thought about somebody in particular, uh, what you have to do is you have to look at that person in a different way. Uh, yeah, so you look at that person, instead of seeing the negative qualities, you focus on the good qualities in that person. Uh, this is one of the most powerful techniques uh, to overcome negative thinking. Uh. Everyone in this world, we are all kind of complicated, we have many sides to us. Uh, almost everybody has some good qualities. Uh, and by remembering the good qualities in somebody, you can overcome the negative quality just like that. Uh, if you have developed the skill how to do it in the right way. Uh. Or alternatively, if you, it is very hard to find the good points in somebody, uh, you can have compassion on them. Uh, because a person who is very <coughs> difficult, uh, is the first person they tend to hurt is themselves. Yeah? Always, someone who is very difficult and have a lot of negative qualities, uh, they hurt themselves far more than anyone else. And because of that, uh, compassion is the right attitude. Uh. And these things are surprisingly easy to develop. And I would really recommend you to do this. I'm going to talk about this quite a lot later on. So I'm kind of just giving you a preview now uh, of what's uh, coming down in the next couple of days. Uh. 
Uh, that is the first method the Buddha talks about. The second method talks about is to remember the dangers in these thoughts. Uh, yeah? To remember the danger in ill will. Remember that it takes you away from wisdom, uh, takes you away from Nibbana, takes you away from happiness. It causes suffering for yourself and others. Uh, and after a while, think, oh, I don't want to go there. Too much problems, too much suffering. Just you know, get rid of it. Uh, and you kind of change. And you, because of that um, uh, tremendous uh, 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 problems that come with this kind of thinking. You just let go of it straight away and you go somewhere else. Uh. Then there is the method which is just ignoring the thought. Yeah? So let's say that the thought arises of ill will uh, and instead of uh, doing anything in particular with it, you just stay with the breath. Uh, and you kind of stay with the breath and you kind of allow the thought to kind of disappear in the background. Uh. And if you're able to do that, just focus on the breath, uh, sometimes the thought just disappears automatically as you stay with the breath. Uh, um, so, which one of these should we choose? And which one you should choose depends on the situation, depends on your ability, depends on how trained you are with these things. Uh, but for example, if it is a person who you're having difficulties with, uh, and if you have trained yourself <coughs> in seeing the positive sides of that person, and that is a strong perception in your mind, and then all you have to do is shift your perception see the good qualities. Uh, and as you do that, uh, bam, the thought actually disappears. Uh, but you have to have some background to be able to do that. Uh, yeah? Then you can think about, and for many people, they haven't got enough training to be able to do that. Uh, same thing with seeing the danger. It takes a certain amount of training uh, to understand the danger in these this thoughts. Uh, so if you haven't got the training again, it might be difficult. Uh, so sometimes what you have to do is simply stay with it. Okay, stay with the breath. Uh, yeah? Stay with the breath, go back to the breath, don't pay attention to the thought, and if you do that in the right way, the ill will will disappear. Alternatively, another way of doing it is just to observe the particular thought. Yeah? There is ill will in the mind. Now, ill will is sustained by the way you observe a particular object. So if there is a person who you have ill will towards, it is sustained by remembering the bad qualities in that person. If you start observing your thoughts, what you are doing is that you are withdrawing your attention from the cause of the problem and just looking at the thought instead. And because you're withdrawing your attention from the cause, it tends to die down. You just watch the thought. You think, oh, this is interesting. The thought, and as you watch the thought, it kind of gradually dies down. This is the fourth method uh, the Buddha talks about in this particular sutta. And so these are all uh, useful techniques. But uh, the first two ones are by far the most powerful ones. So if you are able to shift your attention, see the positive aspect in that person, it is far more powerful than these other ways of doing it. Uh, and you can let go of things often just like that if you use it in a, a skillful way. Uh, the last, there's one more method at the very end, and that is called suppression, repression. Uh, the Buddha says you, uh, you uh, uh, clench your fist, you press the, uh, t your tongue against the roof of your mouth, and you beat down, constrain mind with mind. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that method eh? because it's very <laughs> painful and very unpleasant and it can lead to all sorts of problems if you do it wrongly. Eh? If you're very skilled, you can do that, eh? but normally wouldn't recommend that method. Eh? Okay, I'm going to stop there because it's getting very late already. Eh? So uh, once again, have a nice night, eh? a good rest, and we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Eh?